So welcome to the Ali at SBU uh, virtual lecture series. We have Dr. Chris, Chris Dudulu here. He is with the university. He is a neuropsychologist in the Stony Brook Center for Excellence of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease and is a research assistant professor for, of psychiatry and behavioral health and neurology in the Renaissance School of Medicine at SBU. Boy, that's a mouthful. I'm sure he'll get into <laughs> explaining a little bit more about that. But Dr. Chris earned his um earned his PhD in psychology, specializing in neurocognition from the City University of New York. He completed a postdoc uh, fellowship in neuropsychology at New Jersey Medical School and the Neuropsychology and Neuroscience Laboratory of the Kessler Foundation. He currently provides neurocognitive evaluations to help guide diagnosis and treatment planning for individuals with dementia and their families. He also educates healthcare providers and the general public on topics related to dementia and healthy brain aging. I'd like to welcome Dr. Chris. Chris, are you there? Oh, wait a minute. Chris might be having some trouble here. Dr. Chris. I'm going to continue admitting people. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as soon as he's back. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Elizabeth. That's okay. In the meantime, if anybody has questions, we're going to take them at the end. So if you're more than welcome to type them into the chat. Uh, during the lecture. So Dr. Chris, it's all you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Sorry, I was, uh, was a little distracted there. No um, but uh, it's a pleasure being here. Um, and uh, as, as you're saying, I'm a neuropsychologist and um, I'm at the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease. So I see a lot of folks who are coming in wondering whether um, their, their, their cognition has declined for one reason or another. And, um, you know, what I want to do today is um, uh, talk to you a little bit about that process. So if you wanted to be screened, um, you know, what would what would that entail? You know, because the thing is that lots of us worry at some point that we are uh, losing a step as we get a little bit older. And uh, most of the time that is uh, as a matter of healthy aging. But on occasion, it, it, it's due to something else. And so um, you might want at some point to get your head examined. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some brief screening instruments that we use to do that, um, tell you what they measure, tell you how um, such uh, evaluations can help to distinguish healthy aging from uh, um, causes of dementia and mild cognitive impairment. And then um, um, mention a little bit, I know that you had Dr. Absar here last week, um, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit more um, uh, about how to keep your brain healthy because that's what we all want. So um, I, uh, it, I'm gonna show you this, this study here on this, on this um, uh, on this slide, you see that about 11%, one in nine folks who are over 45 here in New York are worried about their, their, uh, their memory or some other aspect of their cognition. So it's a, a fairly common thing. And these are just folks who are just 45 years old, youngsters, as I would call them. Um, so it's a fairly common uh, experience. Um, and lots of people are concerned about things like dementia or, um, or Alzheimer's disease or some other um, cause for cognitive decline. So uh, one of the things I wanna do is just define our terms here, okay? So dementia is not a specific brain disease, right? Dementia is just this category, uh, this descriptive term that we use for folks who are having um, uh, problems with their cognition, problems thinking. It could be memory, could be some other aspect of thinking. And it becomes severe enough that it's interfering with their ability to carry out their, their daily activities. Things like driving, taking medicines independently, managing their finances, uh, cooking, uh, following a recipe, uh, things along those lines initially. Um, there are some folks who might have some problems on cognitive tasks, like the ones that I'm going to show you in a, in, in a few moments, but in their daily lives, they're doing okay. They might be struggling a little bit. They, it might take a little more effort for them to remember what it is that they have to do and to actually carry it out, but they're able to do it. And those folks 
are in uh, a category that we term mild cognitive impairment. And both of these things, as I mentioned, can um, be the result of many different disorders um, and, and sometimes from, um, uh, from medication changes or, or, or you know, different types of comorbid conditions. And they tend to affect us as we get older. Um, so dementia, uh, just to uh, drill this in, to your head is not a disease. It's this umbrella category that includes things like Alzheimer's disease or uh, dementia with Lewy bodies or vascular dementia. These are all different reasons, different, different changes within the brain that cause um, uh, cognitive problems and, and problems with functional activities of daily living. Um, it's a fairly, dementia is a fairly Co uh, common uh, disorder. It affects over 50 million people at this point. My, my uh, slides here are a couple of years out of date. About over 6 million people here in the United States. On Long Island, it's over well over 50,000. Um, and it costs an enormous amount of money. So uh, around the world, we spend close to a trillion dollars, if not more, on, on care for people who have different forms of dementia. And here in the United States, it's over a quarter of a trillion dollars every single year. It's been called the greatest global healthcare challenge of the 21st century because a large percentage of, of folks in the developed world, including here in the United States, are, are older. And the, the percentage is increasing, especially as, a, as uh, baby boomers sort of uh, enter this period. So what can cause cognitive decline? Well, there are a lot of different things, okay? Some of them are these um, uh, diseases that I mentioned, like Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. Um, uh, some people have a combination. In fact, it's fairly common that people have a combination of, of, of abnormal changes in the brain um, that we ter would, would term a mixed dementia. But there are also a number of uh, other uh, causes that are that are reversible. We we do not have cures for Alzheimer's disease. I'm very sorry to say, there are some treatments that we have, and we can improve quality of life for the person as well as for uh, the family. Um, but um, uh, we do not have cures. We're we're working on those things, and I'll tell you about some of the research that we're doing and, and opportunities to participate in that if you're interested. Um, but there are other reversible uh, causes, things like vitamin B12 deficiencies or, or an underactive thyroid or um, uh, uh, different forms of infections like UTIs, uh, dehydration, or even my med medication side effects or a number of uh, medicines that have anticholinergic effects. Uh, they're often used, they, they it could be uh, for gastrointestinal problems. And some of these have anticholinergic effects that, that um, make it more difficult to think and remember. And so uh, going to see your doctor for these things is an important thing. The other thing I'll say is um, even if you're not experiencing problems right now, um, it's, it's worth getting a quick screen of your cognition. And in fact, we do that at, at Stony Brook, and I'll tell you about that later. Um, it's good to have a baseline because the number one thing that I say to people when they come in to me is, I, I, you know, I wish I had seen you before you started to have these problems. You're telling me that you're having some difficulties, but I've, I didn't know you before. So um, I will, you know, do my best to try to learn about that person's background. There are various strengths and weaknesses, and we all have strengths and weaknesses, but it's better to have uh, some numbers associated with that. And this quick screen, these quick screens can do that and provide that, that sort of a baseline. Um, but before I get into um, uh, different forms of dementia and, and, and how they um, affect what the brain does, let's talk a little bit about what the brain does when it's doing what it ought to do. All right. And so here's your hint as to the sort of the general thing that brains do for us. And, and uh, what what that is meant to give you a hint of is that brains try to predict our future. More and more neuroscientists believe that um, the brain is best seen as a prediction machine, as, um, as you know, this three pound uh, blob of, 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 of matter within our skulls that helps us to understand what's going on out there in the world and, and does its best to try to predict the future so that we can act in a way that is adaptive, uh, in a way that keeps us alive and helps us to reproduce. So 
um, let me give you an example of how um, that works and what goes into those predictions. Let's say you're sitting down, you're having a cup of coffee, maybe reading a book, and all of a sudden you hear this noise, okay? Well, how do you know what that noise was and how do you deal with what it possibly could be? Well, there's always two sources of information. There's that current sensory input, the noise itself, right, that you might not have been expecting. And then there's also your prior knowledge. And it's that combination of those two things that helps you to understand that leads you to some conclusion or, or some hypothesis or some prediction about what's happening and what you ought to do. Uh, so let's say you, you knew that it was very windy outside, right? And you got trees close to your house. Well, maybe it's the trees hitting up against the windows and that's the noise that you heard outside. Well, that might lead you to one sort of a reaction, but what if instead you heard that uh, you knew that there had been a series of break-ins in your neighborhood. Well, that same noise that you heard might be interpreted very differently and you might respond very differently um, to that same noise. So it's always the current sensory input and the prior knowledge that go into that. And all of that um, um, is, um, is, is um, deciphered within the, within the brain dealing with two basic questions. First, what's important out there in the world? Because there are far too many um, uh, things going on in the world for us to be able to pay attention to all of them. We only pay attention to a very small amount of that. It may, all, may seem sometimes like we see everything around us or hear everything around us, but we do not, I can assure you. So our brains are attuned to what we think is important and then um, um, attuned to trying to adapt and to deal with what's going on out there. So you might like bananas, but you then have to find a banana, whether it's within a bowl of fruit or whether you have to go to the supermarket or whether you have to climb a tree, you know, you have to figure out how to get that banana. All right, so those are the two basic things, it, it, it very <laughs> simply put, that the brain does for us. Um, and all of this develops over time. So we don't come into the world knowing all of this stuff, right? It develops with time and experience. So when we're young, we don't know that much about what's important and what to do about it, right? So everything is kind of fresh and, and new and maybe a little bit scary sometimes. But over time, hopefully, we develop some experience and some, some expertise, at least in those things that we be, have become familiar with, right? Um, and the the bad side, the downside of that is that things aren't quite as fresh as they used to be, right? Uh, you know, well, it's cold again, or well, it's hot again, you know, um, we've seen it before, okay, it's not, not such a big deal to us. And then there's also um, a, a little less flexibility a little less flexibility. It's not that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you can, but it is a little bit harder. We are a little bit, little less flexible, right? So what we have learned over the course of our lifetimes, um, it, it's not that it's perfect, but it's good enough, right? <laughs> the, 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 the interpretations we've made and the actions we've taken have not killed us yet. We're not dead yet, as Monty Python might say, All right? So, um, we go on and over time, we become uh, creatures of habit so that a lot of the things that we do um, are, are repeated. We repeat the same behaviors in recurring contexts. About 40% of our time is spent in these habitual activities, or at least it used to be, right? Until, you know, uh, we've, we've learned this lesson. If there's one silver lining in, in coronavirus, it is that we used to rely a lot on habits and what it did, especially at the beginning, was it threw our routines way off, right? And so things that we never really gave a lot of thought to somehow became important. You know, toilet paper, you know, this shortage of toilet paper, you know, was, uh, was on everybody's mind early on. And we figured out, you know, you know, we learned to identify, you know, what a coronavirus looks like. And, and masks, you know, became more important for people outside of the healthcare field, right? Um, and so, um, these are all examples of, of how we've had to adapt and maybe develop new normals or figure out you know, how to, how to um, deal with, these, with this new environment. So as we get older, there are some changes, but these habits that we have developed, it includes things like, lang like the language that we have learned, the, our understanding of, of facts out there in the world, that stays fairly stable even as we age. So this graph shows that the orange and the red uh, stuff 
stays fairly stable from our 20s all the way over into our 80s, um, but lots of other things decline. Uh, so we should expect as we get older, uh, changes in uh, speed of information processing. We get slower at processing information. Our working memory or our ability to hold on to a small amount of information, um, um, uh, like, a, like a telephone number, uh, decreases as we, get, as we get a little older. And our ability to place new things into long-term memory declines. So our ability to learn a new list of words or to remember a, a story uh, that we have just heard. Um, but those things that have already been uh, sort of hardwired earlier on into our brains remain a little bit more stable. So those are the things that we expect with normal aging. Well, what, what differences might we expect in people who might have um, some sort of abnormal aging, you know, for whatever reason? Um, well, um, you know, it, it's not uncommon in normal aging for us to forget a name or an appointment, but then remember it later on. But if someone is having trouble learning new information, holding on to any new information, or, or it is substantially more difficult for them to do that, um, if they do things like repeating the same questions over and over again, or the same statements over and over again. Now, some people like to repeat this, their favorite stories. I'm, what I'm talking about is a change in, an increase in that, re, uh, that repetition. That can sometimes be an early indication that something might be going on that you might wanna check on with your doctor. Um, it's fairly common for, for people, especially if you're retired, you know, to maybe not know the exact date or the exact day of the week even, all right? Um, uh, but it is less common for someone not to know what the season is. So if someone thinks it's winter when it's summer or summer when it's winter, they haven't been paying attention very well, right, over a longer period of time. And that is, is a little more uh, concerning. Uh, different people have different levels of language abilities, but when there's a real decline in a person's ability to express themselves or to understand what other people are saying, that can sometimes be an indication of some brain change that, 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 that uh, might require some attention. Some people have problems with visual images, and I'm not talking about, you know, um, a decline in vision that, that can be um, improved by, uh, by getting glasses um, or, or having your cataracts uh, treated. Uh, I'm talking about not, um, not understanding what it is that you see. So someone with Alzheimer's, for instance, might walk down a hall pass a mirror and see their own image, but not recognize that that's them in the mirror, right? So it's, it's not understanding what, they, what the visual images mean that is more of an issue. Sometimes there are changes in, in judgment. Now we all you know, may make an, an occasional bad judgment, but if um, people are losing money to telemarketers, um, uh, if they're paying less attention to their grooming and hygiene, um, if their judgment is declining in a, in a serious way, that might be an indication that there's a problem. Sometimes the first indication of something, um, some, some form of dementia or mild cognitive impairment may appear more psychiatric. A person might start withdrawing from hobbies or sports or projects, things that they used to like. They might show changes in their mood. They might become more um, emotional or it's possible they might become more apathetic as, as though they sort of don't care what's going on around them. Um, Sometimes those things are psychiatric. That is um, in, in the sense that, you know, it could be a, a depression or an anxiety and you certainly want to treat it because um, uh, depression and anxiety can um, uh, impact, negatively impact our ability to think and remember as well. Um, but sometimes that's also an early indication of, 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 uh, of a dementia or it could be. Um, we all may on occasion misplace things from time to time. Even I have been known to do that, just ask my wife. Um, but when we start placing things um, in unusual places like our glasses end up in the refrigerator, that, that's a little more concernful. Sometimes people start to have difficulty doing things that they used to do without much trouble, like cooking a familiar recipe or driving to a familiar location. Those things are a little bit more unusual and, 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 um, and uh, might be a sign that, that you should check in with your, with your healthcare provider. Um, 
So one of the things that a healthcare provider would do, or a place like uh, where, where I work at the, at the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease here at Stony Brook, um, is a cognitive screening test. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about one called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, and this is actually the test that uh, former President Trump took um, a, a few years ago, and it got a lot of uh, publicity at the time. Um, this uh, it, it's a it's a perfectly reasonable quick screen. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to, to administer. And it covers a lot of different areas. It just doesn't spend a lot of time on any one of them. So it's not as complete an, an evaluation as you would get if you came to see, you know, a, a neuropsychologist like myself and did a full evaluation, but it's enough to, you know, give an overall indication of how one is doing. Um, and it covers such things as uh, how well oriented the person is to uh, time and place and person, how well they're able to pay attention, learn and remember information, deal with unusual situations. We call um, what we uh, what uh, that, that tap what we call executive functions, how they process visual information or use language. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these areas just to give you some flavor of what um, you might expect. Um, so. Um, you know, we, we think of orientation uh, as, as this uh, three-dimensional thing being oriented to person, place, and time. Now, person, you know, knowing who you are, knowing who the people around you are, uh, those, those, that kind of information tends to be fairly stable. You, you have familiar folks that you tend to see more, more often. The places where you tend to be tend to be fairly stable, but time, time is not so stable, right? Time is, time is always passing. And um, so as I, as I noted um, earlier, you know, we might not know the exact date of the month or what even what day of the week it is that that's, you know, a, a common error that 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 that, that people could make uh, young or old alike. But especially um, if someone is retired and less uh, structured in that way, um, but not knowing the month or the season or the year would be would be more problematic. And oftentimes that kind of a, of lack of orientation or difficulty with orientation might be an indication that something might be going on beyond normal aging. Um, as I noted, there's so much going on out there in the world that we can't possibly uh, take it all in. Um, so somehow we have to funnel uh, some selected portion into our brain. So if I were to give you a list of four words like moose, peanut, sun, and envelope, you'd have to somehow get that into your brain um, and, and in order to be able to repeat it for me or to put place these objects in some order. Uh, one way to, to encode that information to sort of make it more solid might be to come up with some visual representation like having Bullwinkle there and, and all the, the rest of the, the objects that I've created there um, on the right side of that slide. You might try to process the objects in terms of their size, you know, put them in order from peanut up to sun um, or, um, you know, and, and so the, the simple way to just sort of take that information in would be just to repeat those things in the order that they're presented. And the more complex way that might uh, engender more and more solid encoding of that information um, might involve organizing it in some way that makes sense to you, creating a story from it or creating a visual image for it. Um, and then there are times when you are asked in, in life to, to select certain things by, by, you know, whether someone is testing you in, in this cognitive screen, for instance. Um, I might tell you uh, to respond whenever you hear a certain letter, for instance, or um, I say a certain word, that's when you, you should respond. Um, and there are times when you're going to have to sustain that attention over a long period of time, and that can sometimes be difficult. So these are all different aspects of attention. And oftentimes, especially in, 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 in our current environment, our attention is divided, right? So we've got these these smartphones and stuff that are so distracting to us, um, uh, or uh, or you know multiple people are talking to you, or you've got the radio on and you're you're having a conversation, or a zillion other things, right? 
And um, our brains actually do not divide their attention. They simply switch back and forth from one thing to another. And our ability to do that declines, um, our ability to go back and forth declines, um, it becomes less efficient, becomes slower as we, as we get older. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that it's, uh, that texting while driving is, is a bad idea for everybody, but especially as we get older. Um, but simply repeating that information or uh, saying it immediately afterward is, is not good enough. There's actually a separate um, set of structures that help us um, to, to take that information and hold on to it over a period of time, over a period of minutes, and then hopefully for the most important information anyway, to hold it in, in long-term memory so that we can recall it uh, days and weeks and months and possibly years later. So putting that information into long-term memory is another thing that we look at with these cognitive screening tasks. Um, and you know, it could be just a, a list of words that someone is asked to remember or a, a bunch of designs that they see that they have to recognize and or uh, reproduce. Um, these would all be um, the types of learning tasks that, you, that we might use. And these, um, uh, these activities, this learning and long-term memory um, uh, involves circuits within our brain uh, that, are, that are sort of deep within the cortex. And it is unfortunate that Alzheimer's disease tends to affect some of these areas that are important for those abilities early on. So um, um, Alzheimer's disease, we don't know the cause of Alzheimer's disease, but we know that there are, are, are uh, specific types of um, abnormal proteins that build up within the brain, uh, abnormal plaques and uh, tangles, either within or between the, the neurons, the, the, the brain cells. Um, and um, so we can look at how those build up within the brain and they tend to follow, although not always, but in the, in the classic form of Alzheimer's, they tend to follow this pattern where they spread out from those areas that are very important for new learning and memory and, and spread out from there. And um, uh, so that's why um, a, uh, uh, you know, noticing that someone around you is repeating themselves more and more can be um, 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 a subtle clue that something might be going on and that it could be, you know, might be um, Alzheimer's related. Doesn't have to be, but it could be um, because that, that is uh, uh, the, the, the damage to the brain, at least early on, often impacts those areas that are important for holding on to information over a period of time, right? So not so much repeating the words right away, but holding on to them over a period of, of minutes. Um, visual processing is also very important in our lives and, um, and is also a examined in these kinds of screening tests. We might look at ability to sort of understand what someone sees, like the, the, the or angles of, of lines and knowing, you know, how they are, uh, you know, at what angle they are, you know, it's just basic um, uh, visual perception. It might involve trying to understand the, 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 the gestalt or the gestalt and how things go together. So understanding that these three pieces in the center of this, of this figure here are, uh, would create a flamingo if one were to, you know, have the pieces at hand and to place them together. Um, there might also be um, tasks where someone is required to use uh, visual motor um, 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 organization in order to construct some object like a, like a complex design like the one that I'm showing you there. So all these things could go into a quick screen as well. Um, we might also examine motor processes. <clears throat> you know, we can examine our motor abilities in various ways. There, there are gross motor uh, activities, things like gait, just watching a person walk and, and how uh, stable they are. Um, and we can also look at fine, more fine motor activities. So, you know, ability to, uh, to write is, is, is an indication or, uh, or ability to move your hands in a certain way, touch your nose, touch your left elbow. Um, with motor abilities, we often will look at speed um, as well as accuracy, and it's a fairly, it can be a fairly sensitive measure to, to things that might be going on. Um, 
obviously, um, well, maybe not obviously, it's important to note that when someone is asked to do something, that um, any behavior is can be um, impacted by in a variety of different ways. If they don't understand your language, they can't do this. It might not mean that their that their motor abilities are, imp are impaired. It could be their language, right? It could be their vision that 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 interferes. It could be um, you know. So any um, any behavior that we see um, could be impacted for various reasons. And in a, in a more complete neuropsychological evaluation, we'd be paying attention to trying to dissect what might be leading to a poor performance on any particular task by looking at patterns across a, a number of different tasks. Language is also often uh, is, is also extremely important for us. So, so much of the information we take in is, as you know, exemplified by what we're doing here today, it comes in through our, through language, right? So uh, we might look at different aspects of language in a, in, a, in a quick screen or in a fuller evaluation. We might look at comprehension, understanding um, what people say, uh, following commands, um, seeing whether a person can repeat words or sentences for us. Uh, we might ask them to express themselves. We might note how uh, articulate they are in conversation. Um, we might ask them to name things that we show them or name things that we define for them. So what do you uh, use to clean your teeth? You know, ask them for, you know, that, that to name that object or show them a toothbrush and ask them to name it, you know. Um, so these would all be different ways of trying to assess a person's language and determine if there's some um, aspect of language that is in, impacted here. Um, as I mentioned early on, a lot of the things that we do are, are, are habitual. But when we leave that sort of autopilot, we engage what we uh, term executive functions. Executive functions r require us to inhibit our initial impulses to switch from one thing that we were doing to something else, to sort of plan out um, what we should do in situations where we didn't uh, expect to see what we're doing, to see what we're seeing, or to reason, or to, or to uh, solve problems. These all entail um, this general category of what we call executive functions. And they all depend upon the person being unfamiliar um, so you're asking a person to do something that they don't normally do. So for example, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a Stroop test, but this is one here for you. So when, uh, when people who are good readers, um, who are literate, uh, see words, uh, see letters on a page, they read the words. That's the first thing that they do. They don't generally comment on the color of the ink, right? Um, the color of the letters that are presented to them. That's not what they tend to pay attention to. So when you see the word blue, red, and green, as you do on that top um, line, uh, it, it, you know, uh, those col the colors of the ink or the colors of the, of the letters for the words are consistent with the, that they match the, the, the words there. But down below on that second line, the color of the ink and the word itself are, uh, are, are contrasting. And so in order for me to say what the color of the letters is for that first word on the left, I have to inhibit reading the word blue and paying attention to the color of the, of, of the letters, which is red. And so, in, so saying red, green, and blue in that order on that second row requires me to slow down to inhibit what my initial impulse would be. Now, if I asked you to do that task a million times or even a hundred times over a short period of time, it would become familiar enough to you that it you would no longer be as slow, right? It would become more habitual to you. So any of these tasks can with time become more habitual. In that case though, they're not measuring um, these executive functions any longer. Um, another um, aspect of even a quick screen might involve some um, appreciation 
uh, of, of, the, of the person's ability to um, do abstract reasoning. So if they were presented with, an, with three words, apple, orange, and insect, and um, were asked to uh, pick the two that go best together, you know, being able to say apple and orange go together because they're both fruits would be a good thing, or knowing that insect sticks out, it is not as similar because it is not a, um, not a fruit, right? You could do the same thing with visual objects, you know, so both the triangle and the square are, um, have straight lines, whereas the circle has, uh, has the curved lines. And so that one, uh, that object sticks out in that way. So these are just different aspects of abstract reasoning that could also go into one of these quick screens. Um, another thing that we might want to do in, uh, even in a quick screen is to look at a uh, person's emotional state. Um, this um, uh, comes from the, this PHQ-2 is a very quick screen for, for depression, right? So if a person is showing little interest or pleasure in doing things or feeling down, depressed, and hopeless, and they've been feeling that way for a couple of weeks, for more than half of the days, that's, the, you know, that, that's an indication of something more than just some, some um, normal sadness, you know, when people do, you know, normally experience some sadness over, over the course of, 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 of a normal uh, life. <laughs> um, but, but this, uh, these might be indications of something more than that, and, and, um, and might be something that are, is worth speaking to your um, healthcare provider with, uh, about. Um, the other thing, uh, I don't have a slide for this, but I was mentioning these um, activities of daily living. So another thing that you might do within a quick screen might be to ask the person um, how well they are able to, or are asking um, sometimes the spouse or someone who knows them well, how well that person is functioning in their daily lives doing things like driving, um, doing things like shopping independently, being able to remember a list of items as well as they used to. Some people are good at that, some people are not, but it, has there been a decline? Has there been a change? Um, uh, knowing whether a person can take their medicines independently, um, knowing whether they can um, uh, manage their finances, uh, again, taking into account that some people are good at those things and some people are not so good at those things and some people's uh, among spouses uh, share <laughs> some of those activities and some people have, have <laughs> you know, the, the husband or wife may specialize in, in that financial management aspect. But what you're looking for are changes in functional activities uh, that might be an indication of some kind of decline that, that might be concerning. Um, so those are the things that would go into um, a, sort of a quick screen. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, we do those at, at, at Stony Brook, and I'll give you the information how to um, contact us if you're interested in, in, wanting, in wanting to do that for free. Um, um, but none of us really want to um, have <laughs> to experience cognitive decline. And I know that Dr. Um, Absar mentioned different aspects of trying to prevent um, 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 cognitive decline and to keep our brains healthy. Um, but I'm going to mention a little bit uh, about it as well, just sort of pound it in well, because these things can make a difference. It, it's estimated that, that not quite half, but close to half, over 40% of our um, uh, risk of, um, of experiencing a dementia can be um, impacted by our uh, lifestyle uh, choices. And so um, uh, it's important to sort of pay attention to these things because they can really make a difference. And we can talk about prevention uh, in, in sort of three general areas. So one is to sort of increase brain cognitive reserve. That's that blue circle there. You can do that through um, trying to keep your senses uh, as, uh, as acute as possible by uh, getting hearing aids when you need them, by getting um, uh, by, by getting your vision checked. Um, cataract surgery actually has been shown to be sort of strongly correlated with um, uh, improved, uh, with a reduced chance of uh, cognitive decline. Um, wearing hearing aids 
is also uh, associated with, with reduced um, risk. Um, we don't know whether these things are causal, but we, uh, the, the, the relationships are, are stronger than we might, than one might imagine. Other things that we can do to sort of increase our, our cognitive reserve is, is to continue our education as you're doing here, you know, as, as part of Ali, um, interacting with other folks um, helps, um, treating depression helps. But if you look at that one thing right there in the center, exercise also helps to increase our cognitive reserve. Reducing brain damage, um, uh, our brain is just three pounds, but it uses um, about 20 to 25 percent of all of the resources that we take in um, uh, uh, in terms of our oxygen and, and, and glucose. All those fuel, all of that fuel that we take in um, th uh, throughout our lives, about a fifth to a quarter of it goes directly to our brain. And so you want to keep the pipes clean. You want to deal with things like um, um, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. You want to um, deal with things, uh, metabolic disorders that, it, uh, that impact our metabolism of glucose, like diabetes. Uh, you want to stop smoking because that's horrible for your brain as well as for the rest of your health. So these are all things that you can do to try to um, help in that, in that way. Um, reducing brain inflammation, that green on the circle on the right hand side. Uh, you can do that in part through um, exercise, excuse me, through um, uh, uh, diet and, um, and then exercise as well. And so I'm going to focus on exercise and diet um, for a moment and tell you a little bit more about those things. And, you know, one of the things I want to emphasize to you is that the data on the impact of exercise, not only for prevention, but as a treatment for people with Alzheimer's disease and, and mild cognitive impairment is fairly strong. Aerobic exercise has a moderate effect, um, and uh, scientists don't use that word moderate lightly. Um, the, the effect is, 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 is not a strong one, because that would be a different category, but moderate is pretty good. And it's better, uh, or at least as good as any of the medicines that we've got. And um, so uh, repeated studies and the average of a, a number of studies in what we call a meta-analysis show that exercise can, um, can benefit some benefit folks, even if they have Alzheimer's, even if they have a mild cognitive impairment. Those people who uh, do exercise, especially aerobic exercise, are doing better years later if they have been, um, uh, if they have been doing the exercise. Um, and um, aerobic exercise, in, in case you're wondering, um, involves any sort of activity that increases our, 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 our heart rate and our, maybe makes us breathe a little bit uh, harder. Um, and uh, things like walking, gardening, dancing, playing tennis, playing golf, um, doing laundry, going up and down the stairs is excellent exercise. You may not enjoy it, but it's really good exercise. Um, um, but basically anything other than what uh, I think probably most of us are doing, I know what I'm doing is sitting down, right? So sitting down and lying down don't count, but moving in any of its forms uh, counts to a degree. And the more of it you do, the better um, for the most part. Um, so I want to emphasize that. And exercise has an impact in a, in a variety of different ways. One of the ways, one of the things that it does is it reduces um, what we call chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation has been linked to a variety of different diseases throughout the body, but including the brain, including things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Um, um, we know that there's inflammation. Like when we do exercise, let's say we've been lifting weights for the, for the first time in a while, our muscles are, are a little sore, right? That's due to inflammation. That's, but that's what we call acute inflammation. It's short-lived. It's short you know, after a, a day or two, a few days, it, it goes away. But um, what's really bad for us is chronic inflammation, this, this um, overactive inflammatory response. And um, it turns out that exercise over the long run reduces um, chronic inflammation. And that's a good thing for our brain. It also helps us to create new brain cells. And that's something that we didn't 
quite appreciate because we thought uh, until you know, 20, 30 years ago that that once people were adults, they didn't create a new brain, any new brain cells. And so we had to take care of all the brain cells that we have. Well, it, it's true that we have to take care of the brain cells that we have, but it, it's also true um, that we do continue to create new brain cells throughout our lives, maybe not quite as, 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 as quickly, but throughout our lives. And one of the things that we can do, even as we age, to increase that rate of, of, of new, um, uh, new growth is to exercise. And so that's another way that it may be having an impact. And exercise also um, can um, interact with other things that we know can help to prevent um, uh, dementias, or at least lower our risks of, of a dementia. It can help to treat um, high blood pressure. It can help us to keep our weight in check. It can improve our mood. Um, it certainly impacts physical inactivity. Um, depending on the exercise, it can, it can be a social activity. Um, it can help us to, um, in terms of, of metabolic disorders and so forth, so diabetes as well. So all these are different things that, that exercise can help us deal with. Uh, one of those things uh, I'll just mention, though, um, these, these circles on the right side, there's a bunch of circles, and the size of the circle says something about how those things have an impact. And physical acti inactivity is, is a 2%, but as I mentioned, it interacts with all these other things as well. But the largest circle up there is hearing loss. And I mentioned that earlier, right? That, that, and we don't know for sure, as I mentioned, whether um, losing your hearing causes dementia, but we know there's a fairly strong association between hearing loss and dementia. And so um, it's worth getting your hearing check. If more people um, wore hearing aids um, and it was as common as wearing glasses, that, that might make a real difference. Um, and then there was some recent research, and I mentioned, um, you know, cataract surgery. There was a recent study looking at um, cataract surgery that found that people who had had such surgery were at lower risk of, uh, of dementia later on. Um, and in contrast, people who had glaucoma surgery did not um, show that same reduced risk. Um, so cataract surgery, as soon as you have it, um, you know, anybody who's had it can tell you that their, their vision improves immediately. Glaucoma, on the other hand, kind of slowly robs you of your vision over time. And the surgery itself doesn't automatically improve it. It just sort of stops the, the decline. And that may be the reason that cataract surgery is uh, related to uh, these lower risks. Um, but, um, you know, keeping your senses acute um, may uh, help sort of keep you in the game cognitively and may, uh, may lower your risk. Uh, last thing I'll mention, and we are running a little low on time, but you know, uh, and I'm sure Dr. Absar mentioned some of this, but uh, the Mediterranean diet is a healthy diet that's been shown to lower people's risks of um, uh, cognitive decline. Um, uh, can you see the top of my screen? I know this, I've got this sharing thing on there, sorry. Uh, essentially, it, uh, you, can, you can think of the Mediterranean diet as, as this pyramid where you should be eating more of the stuff on the bottom of the pyramid and less at the top. So at the top is meats and sweets or red meats and sweets. So less of that, you know, and, and, and that's different from sort of the, the, the typical American plate, right? With a big steak on in the middle of your, you know, makes everybody happy. And then, um, you know, maybe a potato and, and uh, maybe something else green uh, that makes up a tiny portion of your plate. But if you want to be a little healthier, you know, having things like um, whole grains and pastas and nuts um, uh, taking up and fruits and vegetables taking up more of your plate. And then if you're going to have some meat or some protein to ha have uh, a little less of, of that, eating um, um, oils that are, that are better for us, like olive oil, um, some fish, seafood. These are all things that go into a Mediterranean diet. Um, and it's very hard to do these studies 
but there was, uh, it's very hard to do studies where you get people to eat what you want them to eat over a long period of time. <laughs> but uh, the Mediterranean diet is easier for people to, to sort of follow than lots of other diets. And there was a study that was done in Barcelona over four years. And the people who followed that diet um, best, uh, people who were given a supply of olive oil, who were given a supply of mixed nuts, those people were thinking better at the end of that study than the people who were not, and this was a randomized clinical trial. Um, so that's basically it. We do lots of research. I'm just going to leave this screen here uh, for you to, to, to see if there are any studies that you are interested in, you would be welcome to, to participate either um, as a person who might be experiencing some problems or even, or as a healthy control. We need folks in, in all areas in, in both, both those um, conditions for most of these studies. We have studies looking at um, different types of neurotransmitters in the brain. We do uh, fancy neuroimaging that isn't available in other places. Um, there's uh, people looking at the relationship of, of emotions and, and uh, cognition. There are people who are looking at um, those people who are caring for someone who might have cognitive decline, like Alzheimer's, um, and, and the health of those folks. And then last of all, uh, I, I mentioned this a couple of times, but we do free cognitive screening. So on Thursday afternoons at Stony Brook, um, uh, sometimes at Comac, sometimes at, at, in Putnam Hall, at Stony Brook, we do free cognitive screenings. You'd be welcome to come. Uh, if you're interested in contacting us for any reason, you can call us at, uh, at that number, 954-2323. So that's it for me, I think. So I'd be happy to take some questions. I don't know, Elizabeth, if you've been paying attention to the chats, I have, oh, there's lots. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Nick asks, Prevagen. Yeah. Uh, the real thing snake oil. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, well, we don't know. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing. So a lot of these supplements, they don't have to go through FDA regulations. They, supplements don't pass the same stringent standards as, as, as uh, drugs do. Um, that's why they all, will often say they help maintain healthy something, but they can't say they treat a disease. The only way you can treat a disease, say that you treat a disease here in the United States, is if you um, go to the FDA and, and, and show some evidence of that. Things like Prevagen are, um, first of all, a little bit expensive. Your money could be probably better spent on uh, you know, eating a healthier diet just in general. Um, and, you know, when people ask me for different things, I just say, you know, probably the best thing that you can do is just go out and take a walk, but walk for 10 minutes. That's probably better than the, the best medicine that you can take if, if you're able to walk. If you can't walk, if you know, that's difficult for you, you know, find any other activity. Um, Prevagen, the, the data isn't there for Prevagen. So, so I'm not going to disparage them. I'm just going to say that much. But they do a lot of advertising and, and, and more than they should probably. <laughs> uh, a couple of people have asked, uh, is Alzheimer's hereditary at all? Yeah, so there, there, is some, uh, there are some um, genetic links to, to Alzheimer's disease. There are some forms of Alzheimer's. Most people who get Alzheimer's tend to get it very late in life. Um, the, the chances increase um, quite a bit as we get older. So the highest risk factor for developing any of these disorders, including Alzheimer's, is, is age. Um, but um, uh, there are some uh, people who get Alzheimer's early, and that form the, the, or those forms of early onset Alzheimer's tend to be more strongly genetically linked. So if someone in your family has had Alzheimer's um, before the age of 60 or 65, that would be uh, kind of, uh, of of greater concern. Um, but um, lots of people, while, while there is some increase, we do ask whether you have a family member who's had um, you know, Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, um, the, the, those, uh, those links are not nearly as strong. They do increase your risk a little bit. But they also, you can also benefit by doing some of these lifestyle modification factors. The people who are at risk may benefit more from things like exercise. Doing it earlier, I guess. And is it the same for dementia? Like the yeah, whole so, category of dementia, does it run in families or? It, they're all there are all these different kinds of dementias, right? right. So Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, frontotemporal dementias, each of them, there are some links 
uh, genetically that we know about. For most of them, they're not that strong, but some of them they are. Things like Huntington's disease, which uh, clearly impacts uh, cognition as well as other things that that's very strongly linked. But for most of them, it's it's not that strong. Okay. Uh, someone asked, uh, Nick, yes, is the recreational use of THC in the form of edibles especially harmful during one's senior years? It's hard to say. They didn't do a lot of research in these in these uh, these uh, recreational drugs uh, as they are now. They now you know everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. They're legalizing all these things, and uh, we don't we don't know you know because they wouldn't let you do research or they made it very difficult to do this research in the past. And so we're behind the eight ball on some of this stuff. Um, you know, uh, so I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Uh, does hearing loss affect dementia? And so, yeah, we don't know that it causes it, but as I said, it's strong. It's a very strong correlation, right? So we don't know if, if, if um, you know, we don't know if the, 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 the hearing loss causes the dementia or having dementia makes it harder for you to hear. You know, it could go that way too. We don't know. Okay. There's a strong relationship. And Chris asks, could a ketogenic diet and or 36 to 72 fasting improve brain health? Um, so, I, you know, I think the data is strongest in terms of brain health for this Mediterranean diet and what they call the mind diet. And that was probably something that Dr. Absar mentioned to you last week. Mind diet is very similar to the Mediterranean diet. Those are the ones that have the strongest evidence for them. Um, and those are the ones less so. Okay, thank you. Linda asks, does taking an antidepressant add to the possibility of developing dementia? Um, having depression seems to be linked with um, experiencing dementia. We don't know exactly how those things are linked, but getting your depression treated is, is likely going to reduce your, your odds rather than not treating it, right? So it's medicine and, 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 and treating your, you know, uh, depression is important. And it's also very important just for your quality of life, right? So you, you want to treat depression and, um, and, and it's likely that it's going to benefit your cognition, but I don't know uh, I, I, I don't know that's, uh, I'd have to get back to you on that, on that research there. So the drug itself may or may not. I don't believe that it, that there's been any link to it, to it showing a decline, but I just can't say uh, right. off the top of my head here. Here's another good question. Uh, Naomi, Naomi answer, asks, does tinnitus, that's a, I'm pronouncing it right, tinnitus. Cause tinnitus or tinnitus, yeah. Tinnitus, yeah. Cause cognitive decline. Uh, I don't. I have not seen that research. I'm not aware of that. You know, uh, tinnitus or tinnitus is, is that ringing in the ears that we sometimes experience. And I, I hope that it's not because I sometimes have that myself, but I, I don't know. But I don't, I don't know of any research that specifically links that. I think you can experience that uh, symptom for a variety of reasons. There may be some reasons that involve, you know, things going wrong in your brain that might be of concern, but all by itself, I don't know of a link between that can, that can linger can it that type of it can yeah yeah um how does drinking wine or having an alcoholic beverage affect your brain health and what if you have wine every day right well the, the, first of all uh having a lot of wine every day or having a lot of any alcohol every day is is definitely bad for your brain. It's true, though, that in the Mediterranean diet, a glass of wine with your meal, with your dinner is, is sort of part of that, um, that, that, that diet. And, um, um, you know, people go back and forth. So nobody, no doctor is going to recommend you begin drinking, right? Um, and no doctor is going to say you should have more than one drink a, a, a day um, for your cognitive health. Uh, but as to whether it does help, it, it's possible. But it, but they the studies have generally looked at it within the large that larger diet rather than uh, all by itself. Okay, Bruce asks uh, aerobic means with oxygen exercises that are smooth and rhythmic, rhythmical in nature, such as jogging, walking, dancing, skating. Golf is not an aerobic exercise, so. 
Well, go, no, golf can be an aerobic exercise. It's 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 better if you walk rather than you're getting in the golf cart. But but still, you, you know, you're walking, you're you're moving, you're standing. You know, um, the more you move around, the more aerobic it's going to be. You know, you could make golf <laughs> less aerobic if you go out of your way. But there, it's better than sitting down on the couch, definitely. And and I, I, I would you know, play golf, enjoy it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. And, and I just have a question to tag on to that. Is yoga um, a good exercise for, for, the, for brain health? Um, so, Dr. So it, yeah. So it's not, not quite as aerobic, right. But, but um, uh, it, it's probably good for our emotional health. Um, and um, Dr. Apsar would know more specifically about, about that area. Mm. Um it's definitely good for our quality of life, for our for our ability to pay attention, for our ability to uh, regulate our emotions. Uh, um, so there's there's lots of good sides to it um, in terms of uh, large. It, the the data is not as strong um, as for a, you know aerobic okay. exercise, but yeah. but yoga can involve more aerobic sort of exertion depending on the kind of yoga you're doing like hot yoga right <laughs> yeah. um does rheumatoid arthritis have an impact on developing al alzheimer's um i don't i don't know if studies linking it you know it's, it's certainly an inflammatory response mm -hmm. and so it could be you know things that you could do to reduce that and in, in, inflammation might be useful but whether it, it whether of the the inflammation of joints is also reflected in inflammation in the brain, I, I I don't know. So the answer is I don't know. I could check on for you. Okay. And does doing puzzles and word games word games help protect them? Uh, you know, I, I think people should remain engaged. We encourage people to remain engaged sort of physically, cognitively, socially. It's good to do things that are different, things that are challenging, um, you know, learning, uh, you know, a new language, you know, learning to play a musical instrument, you know, doing things that, that you're not all, that are not already habitual for you. Um, so, um, you know, as long as you're finding challenge in it, and, and if you're in, if you're enjoying it, don't stop, you know, do, do the crossword puzzles. But I, I would say that walking is probably better than, you know, same amount of walking is probably better than the same amount of time on a crossword puzzle. Okay. That's all we have. Oh, we, uh, someone asked about the doctor. Uh, Ronnie, do you want to unmute yourself? Were you asking the, the name of the doctor? Was it Dr. Yes, Alcimar? yes. You just mentioned a doctor who might know better about something than... About the yoga? Oh, yeah, that was yeah. Dr. Absar, who I think Dr. spoke... Ni a... Yeah, Nicole Absar. We Nicole had her as a speaker. Oh, I'd like to... Yeah, I remember, because I missed that also. She did another presentation. How do you spell her name? A-B-S-A-R. A, a, okay. a, 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 and do you know if her presentation was recorded or we don't know? It was, yeah. And so can, can you send I, me an email, I'll send it to you. Okay, okay. are you elizabeth.wilson at stonybrook.edu? That is me. Thank <laughs> you. Um, any any other questions? I think we're finished in with the questions in the chat. But any this was fabulous, questions? Dr. Chris. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Anybody yeah. else wants to ask a question, you can feel free to unmute yourself. May I say medication for Alzheimer's? Um, does it, because my mother-in-law is currently taking medication for Alzheimer's and she hates it. She said it's giving her headaches. Can you, can, uh, doctor, can you um, just give me any advice on that, please? Sure. Um, so, you know, we, there are different types of medicines. I'm not sure exactly what she's taking. There are, uh, there's kind of two classes of medicines. The, the, there are um, medicines that, that um, deal with acetylcholine in the brain. Some of them have side of, can have side effects that tend to be mild. They tend to be more gastrointestinal than like headache related. So I'm not sure exactly that that's a, a less common response to that class of medicines. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, um, what might be causing it. And, and I am, you know, after my name is a PhD rather than an MD. So I don't prescribe any of these medicines, right? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Sure. Any Thank other questions? Let me get that in. Does anyone else have any other questions? I think we could ask 10,000 questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I put my name back on the screen. If anybody wants to just uh, email me just at, you know, Christopher.Christodoulou at Stony Brook Medicine. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. edu. I'm happy to, uh, to you know, answer any other questions you might have. We send out a, a monthly newsletter, uh, Dr. Chris, so we can include um, your website with the recording. And if there's any um, any studies or any kind of um, screenings that we can just add that into our newsletter. So sure, if you're yeah. Interested in participating in any of your studies? Okay. Um, you know, that way they they'll have it. You know, readily. Yeah. Readily but, available. Uh, yeah, these are the studies, though. If you're, you know, if you want to look at them right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, I'll and give you, you that. The, and we can put it in you the do newsletter. the screening every day. No, uh, Thursday afternoons. Okay. You okay. know, and we can, you know, schedule you to come in. We people should make an appointment. You know, you call call the number, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll schedule you for a time. It takes about half an hour. Okay. We'll send you a couple things to fill out, and then you spend about half an hour with me, and we just talk. Good. Right. Very good. Well, I thank you. I don't see any other questions, but I thank you for joining us. This is very informative for our members and I'm, I'm sure that they've gained a lot of information from it. We will be sending out the recording. So if anybody has missed it, we'll, um, and we'll be putting it on the website. So Chris, thank you again for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to do that it anytime. Great. And thank you all for joining us. Thank Have you. a good day.